I would like to call to order the council meeting for March 1st, 2016. If we all could, please stand for a moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. Would a council member like to make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of the council workshop meeting held on February 23rd of 2016? To do roll call. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Madam Secretary. Marlon Milner. Present. Olivia Brady. Here. Valerie Scott Cooper. Here. Heather Lewis. Here. Hakeem Jones. Here. Derek Perry. Here. Sonia Sanders. Here. Would a member of council like to make a motion to approve the meeting minutes of the council workshop held on February 23rd of 2016? All in favor? The ayes have it. Those meeting minutes are approved. Earlier this evening, we had an executive session pertaining to litigation and personnel. The next order of business will be a presentation for the Lafayette Street Expansion Project. Mr. Jones. Thank you, Madam President. As council may recall, uh, the uh, Montgomery County pl uh, Planning staff did come to a work session to discuss the uh, Lafayette Street Extension Projects and the plans that they have uh, related to that project. And it was council's desire at that meeting that a, they come again in order for the benefit of uh, public edification and make us a, a brief presentation at the uh, public meeting uh, so that um, citizens would be afforded the opportunity to uh, hear what's going on with the project. Red button, that white button, press it. Okay. And so Mr. M Mr. Matt Edmonds uh, with, with the uh, Planning Commission is here. Uh, to lead his team through the presentation. Thank you very much, Crandall. Uh, can everybody on the uh, council hear me? Sorry, it's locked. It's okay. Great, thank you. All right, Crandall, should I speak very loudly? Speak very loudly. It keeps going in and out, man. Okay. So just speak, speak very loudly. Will do. I, uh, I, I know the uh, aud audible difficulties of this room, so uh, I'll make sure that I speak a little bit louder for everybody up front and in the back here. Uh, my name is Matthew Edmond. I am the uh, Transportation Section Chief with the Montgomery County Planning Commission. Uh, I brought with me tonight as well our consultant engineer, Susan Gian Antonio, uh, as well as our PennDOT project manager, Josephina Brown. Uh, both of them have been part of this project for many years, and I'm pleased to introduce them to you tonight. Uh, what I want to do was come by tonight and uh, give Council a brief update on the Lafayette Street Extension Project, uh, understanding that a number of uh, Council members have changed in the last year, uh, and the last time that we were here from the County to present uh, our progress on this was maybe two or three years ago. So we just want to take the time as we get close to going out to construction on the third and final phase, just want to take a few moments to come in here and uh, uh, give Council a, a little briefing on where we are and a little bit about the project too for some context for those who may not know uh, as much about it. The whole point of the Lafayette Street Extension Project when it was dreamed up about 15 years ago by the county was uh, to connect Norristown to the regional highway system. One of Norristown's greatest assets is its transit access. Uh, the transportation center has two rail lines, eight buses, an inner city bus terminal. Uh, it really is a, a center for transit connections. But here in Montgomery County, we looked at the census data back in the day and we said, 
the majority of people in Montgomery County, and even in this region, are getting around through their cars. And if you look at Norristown on a map, which I put up here uh, very briefly, you know, the highway system goes right by us, but it's been all of our neighbors who have benefited from the economic development that's resulted from everybody making a shift years ago from transit to, to roads. And so, you know, Plymouth Meeting, King of Prussia, you see on that map, they both have blue dots, which are interchanges, and they've also uh, seen economic growth because of that. And Norristown does not not have a easy access from the highways. You can get there, uh, but as I like to say, if you get off at Plymouth Meeting at the Norristown exit of the Turnpike, you have to drive two miles over one road that changes names three times. And so it's not really likely that anyone's going to follow the signs for Norristown from the Norristown exit. But if we could extend Lafayette Street, which is sort of the back door of downtown, take it out to the turnpike, connect it with an interchange, um, Norristown will be only a mile straight shot from the Pennsylvania Turnpike, which has roughly about 90 to 100,000 cars a day on that section. So that would open up the floodgates to economic development opportunities, seeing as how Conshohocken benefited from the same highway access years ago. And they didn't really change who they were. They still have a walkable urban form. They didn't have to suddenly tear everything down and build strip malls, but they were still able to channel all of that economic interest into, you know, what's now basically a growing city. They used to be uh, six, 8,000 people, and they have grown enormously in the last 20 years. So that was the whole idea, seeing of what happened in Conshohocken and trying to translate that success into Norristown. What is the project? Like I said, it's been around for about 15 years. Um, it's an $85 million project, all phases, all right? So we have three different phases, which I'll get into, plus two other ones. Um, and the three phases that the county is overseeing and spearheading and investing in, uh, that from the initial designs all the way through the last piece of construction, that's going to run us about $85 million. It's being paid for 80% by the Federal Highway Administration and 20% by the county itself. And this is unusual because if you know Pennsylvania government, Counties and PA don't really do a whole lot besides a couple of core things, uh, social services, courts, and basically uh, jails, basically uh, uh, the corrections. Those are the three things that Pennsylvania counties do. The last thing they tend to do is pump about $17 million of their own money into roadway projects that also have an economic development benefit. So Montgomery County, uh, over the last 15 years, has really been stepping up to the plate to put their money in and also uh, use our regional funding for transportation to channel Federal Highway Administration dollars to Norristown. And what it's going to result in is that project up there. Now, um, uh, if, if you're able to see it, there are five numbers up on that screen. Uh, phase one was to extend Lafayette Street past where it used to end at Ford Street. Uh, that began in about 2013, ended uh, a year and a half later in 2014, uh, and that is substantially complete. Now, that is going to connect to what's uh, under construction now, which is that big number two up there, uh, which are the local roads that would surround the future interchange with the turnpike. So under that second phase, we've been widening ridge Pike. Uh, we're going to be uh, connecting Diamond Avenue with Fairfield Road, which uh, used to be an offset intersection. We're going to put a signal there. That Diamond Avenue, which what used to be in Plymouth, a small residential street, had a handful of homes on it, was one way. You never know it was there if you blinked. Um, that's going to become the new Conshohocken Road. And so people driving from Conshohocken towards Norristown will have an easier way to get in, especially to the north end, because Fairfield, if you know, connects to Fornant Street. So that will make it easier to get around, safer to get around. And at the very end, we are going to take the existing uh, uh, extension of Lafayette Street that we just finished building, connect it to Diamond Avenue, and so you'll be able to get a little bit easier from Norristown to Conshohocken, and it will split some of the traffic off of Ridge Pike, so not everyone's on Ridge Pike at the same time trying to get in and out of Norristown. Um, and then phase three, and that's underway right now, let me add, started about a year ago, and that will end sometime probably early in 2017. If we can finish later this year, we will, uh, but our contract runs through spring of 17 in case we have to come back and finish our paving in the spring when it gets warm again. Uh, and then the third piece, which is right in the heart of downtown Norristown, that third phase will be to improve and widen and, uh, and, and add to uh, the feel of what Lafayette Street is today. So if you've ever been out to the middle of Lafayette, Street, you know that it's basically a four-lane section, parking on both sides, two travel lanes, it's kind of narrow, it's all concrete, it's beat up because trucks use it every day, it has a huge viaduct on one side, you kind of feel like you're 
penned in. Um, we are going to be changing that dramatically, uh, and Susan is going to go into what that is. Uh, that was going to start in uh, early 2017, and Susan, our engineer, is getting everything teed up with Josephina Brown. Uh, from PennDOT back there behind the boards um, to meet our February 2017 letting. And letting simply just means that's when you open your bids because now you have a real project. People have bid, you know what the numbers are, and you start to award a contract. Uh, the fourth and fifth pieces are in the future. The fourth one is the interchange with the Pennsylvania Turnpike, which a year ago committed publicly to building the interchange. Um, and then the, uh, the fifth piece is the Dan Howard Bridge connection, which is way off in the future when the Dan Howard Bridge finally needs to be replaced place with the new structure. At that time, uh, PennDOT will come in, rebuild that bridge, and uh, as long as the county uh, doesn't let me go, I will be there pushing for that connection with uh, Lafayette Street. Uh, one other note real quick on the interchange. Uh, the turnpike, uh, uh, we'll start working on that, hopefully uh, start design sometime in the next uh, year is our hope. <laughs> Um, that is still underway. We're still working out roles and responsibilities with the turnpike. Um, uh, but that will be moving forward in the near future. And that interchange cannot go online until the turnpike moves to cashless tolling. If you've read the news, you may have heard that the turnpike eliminated the Bristol Road inter or the uh, US 13 Bristol interchange out on the eastern end. Uh, they replaced it with a new gantry system because uh, they're making some changes to uh, when 95 connects. And so as part of that, that was their first all cashless tolling interchanges, this new one they built in the middle of the roadway. And that type of technology, what they want to do eventually is to bring it to the entire turnpike, which allows an interchange like Lafayette Street to get put in at a much cheaper, easier cost and still capture a lot of revenue. So that is probably, if I had to take a guess, I'd say sometime in the early 2020s, uh, hopefully we'll have that interchange up running when the uh, entire turnpike system has their cashless tolling in place. So those are the five pieces. But one of the things that I wanted to do was come tonight and talk about that third phase, which will start in downtown Norristown next year. And so for that, I brought Susan G. Antonio here, uh, our consultant engineer with Gannett Fleming, to talk about that design and to give you a little bit of an update on what has changed since we were here last about two or three years ago. Susan? for everybody to see. I was having trouble with that. So um, same picture uh, is here as well as up here. So as Matt was saying, uh, my name is Susan Jan Antonio. I'm with Gannett Fleming, and um, I'm the project uh, uh, consultant project manager for the se uh, section in Norristown. The section in Norristown extends from its western terminus, approximately at Barbados Street, here on the left, um, then eastward to Ford Street, and that's where the road ends today, um, as you know it, in uh, Norristown. What we'll be doing is reconstructing and widening. So the reconstruction part will be we're going to reconstruct the sidewalks and the road uh, to the approximate same width that it is today from Barbados Street to Mill Street, which is two streets uh, west, or excuse me, east of DeKalb Street. I think everybody hopefully knows DeKalb Street is the main through fair to, um, 202 there. Um, and that in that area, again, we'll be uh, rebuilding curb to curb. It'll be a four lane section. Uh, some areas will have uh, center turn lane, others will have on street parking. And a big thing that we've added in there is at the uh, Norristown Transportation Center, there's a point. What uh, we call Strawberry Walkway or Strawberry Alley. It's actually a Norristown town owned bricked pe pedestrian way that connects Main Street and Lafayette Street. That Strawberry Alley or Strawberry Walkway is uh, a point where a lot of people just naturally cross the uh, road there from the transportation center to head up to Main Street. And it's not a marked pedestrian crossing. This project will be adding a uh, what we call a rapid flashing beacon, uh, which is just a little sign with little lights that flash so the uh, vehicles are aware that it's a high pedestrian area. It's basically a pedestrian sign with flashers. And we'll be putting in a little center island media uh, pedestrian refuge, which will make it much safer as pedestrians will only need to cross one lane of traffic and then look both way or look again and cross another. Uh, we worked closely with Norristown, PennDOT, as well as SEPTA to make uh, to select the location that best fit everybody for circulation for the pedestrians as well as the buses because we didn't want to infringe on their ability to maneuver at the transportation center. 
Uh, so then continuing, um, we have today there is a traffic signal at Swede Street and at DeKalb, and this project will reconstruct those, um, and they'll be maintained. And then, as I said, from um, Mill Street on, we're actually going to start widening. So from Mill Street, it starts to widen, and you can see uh, the little blue line there on the screen. That is Sawmill Run. There's actually a stream that runs through Norristown. Um, by the point that we get to Sawmill Run, our road will be widened to a four-lane road with a center green median and parking on both sides. Um, and the north sidewalk, which is the side uh, up to the top of the um, picture, we, uh, which is what borders our residents in that area, will widen from the five to eight feet that it is today to almost 20 feet in that area. And um, so then from Saul Mill to Ford, we have that widened section where we will have something that's new um, since we were last visited you, is that center turn island or center turn lane wasn't really needed in a lot of the areas. Um, and so we looked at that closely where we had driveways and where we didn't, and we um, made an actual green island there instead of having just a paved sea of asphalt and allowing a lot of maneuvers and potential um, parking where we don't want it in the center of the road. So this will help also give a traffic calming effect through the area, although it doesn't actually narrow the proposed roadway at all. It'll give that feeling and help encourage a re uh, respectable speed through there. Um, and then continuing down to Ford Street. Today, Ford Street is one direction northbound from Lafayette Street to Main Street. This project will actually make Ford Street two-way. Uh, posted today, if you were coming westbound on Main Street, trucks are directed to go down Franklin Street, which is a very residential road. There's a lot of residents and there's residential parking on that road. Uh, by making Ford Street two-way, we'll now be allowed to uh, be able to bring those trucks down Ford Street from Maine, alleviating the truck traffic on that residential Franklin Street. Um, as part of that uh, reconfiguration of Ford Street, obviously there's an existing light at Main Street. That light will need to be reconfigured. The pavement markings will be changed there so that we'll have a left turn lane and the traffic signal will be appropriate for all directions. And then at Lafayette and Ford Street, we'll be installing a traffic signal. That will replace the one that is today at Franklin Street, which will be removed and no longer needed since the traffic will now flow on Ford Street. Um, as part of the project during construction, we will be replacing the culvert uh, under the project, under the roadway area that carries Sawmill Run. So we'll be uh, leaving a very nice new structure there. Uh, it's currently actually a piecemeal of many, many structures from Lafayette Street all the way to Washington Street. So what will actually become the Borough Road will be one brand new con continuous structure uh, meeting today's design criteria. Um, as part of all of this work, the Schuylkill River Trail is um, running directly adjacent to and up on a viaduct on Lafayette Street today. And um, we'll be, with the roadway widening from Mill Street to Ford Street, the viaduct will actually be removed. So we have to move the trail. And as you can see on this line, or actually maybe a little better on this map here that Matt has, the orange line kind of following the bottom is where we'll be relocating the trail. So it'll be a little further from the road, but it'll be accessible through three different connections from the, um, the roadway. So although it may be in horizontal distance be further from the road, there will actually be physical connection and there won't be such a grade differential. So the trail users will actually be able, able to more easily get into Norristown to use the local uh, businesses as well as Norristown residents have more uh, easy access to get onto the trail and use it. And it's, it's a great trail. I personally use it myself and I've seen many commuters out there using it. So that's an exciting new connection, connectivity. There'll be several points of connection along Franklin, Walnut, and then there is one today at Ford, but that will be continued and maintained. Um, and as part of that, we will also be connect making a trail connection through the property on the southeast corner, uh, which would be this corner of DeKalb and Lafayette Street, uh, through the property that we call the Freight Station. It's a county-owned property, and it was... Um, it was originally a freight depot for the railroads. Um, and we'll, um, we're going to be doing some work as part of this project, and the county has some more exciting plans as well for that, pro for that property to make a great connection between the Chester Valley Trail, which this project isn't doing much on, but is coming up from Bridgeport, and will come in and connect to the Schuylkill River Trail, really making this 
corridor a great transportation hub with the railroad, the buses, and the tra uh, trail there. We're going to have a great little hub for transportation of all sorts to come into the area. I think that pretty much covers everything you wanted me to hit, Matt. Did I get anything? No, I think, uh, Susan, I think you did a great job. Um, you know, just to summarize that, you know, in the big picture, this project will be connecting downtown Norristown to the Turnpike, and then when we come in back into Norristown, we'll be basically uh, creating a, a brand new road for you guys, improving the road, improving the trail connections. I was talking to Tom O'Donnell today um, about uh, some things related to Lafayette Street, and I stressed to him that, you know, it's hard to see on this map, and I know that one's kind of far away, but, but this is going to take the Schuylkill River Trail off of that big viaduct, put it down to where it is closer to the street, where people can actually from the neighborhood go to it, and people on the trail can actually get into downtown Norristown from, rather than being separated. It's kind of cool to be on that viaduct, but the reality is it really separates Norristown from this trail, which has about, I just saw the numbers, uh, DVRPC did a, a, a trail usage counts all around the region, and the School River Trail has almost 1,000 people a day on average using it. And those people right now are up high, they get to see a lot of stuff, but they don't really get to come into Norristown until they get to the transportation center. So this project is not just going to help this road, but it's also going to make these other connections um, between the Schuylkill River Trail and Norristown, bring the Chester Valley Trail in to Norristown, wrap it around, connect to the Schuylkill River Trail, so you're going to have two major regional trails that are going to connect right here in downtown, and it's going to do a whole lot of other things just simply uh, beyond the roadway. Um, I, I do see uh, uh, that a hand did went up, but actually, uh, I have just a couple pictures I want to show first, and then if, if that's okay, Olivia, then we'll, we'll get to questions if, if that's all right. Um, but yeah, a lot of things going on when we come back in in about a year. Now, Susan and her team did a great job of trying to translate what these maps mean in 3D and in real life. And so um, you, you see them down here at the floor, but I want to put them up here. Uh, before and after pictures, I think, speak a thousand words. And so this picture was taken, it's looking eastbound from atop the Norristown Transportation Center garage okay you're up at the corner up at the top up in the corner you kind of get a bird's eye view we really like this picture that's what it looks like today you see the freight station in the foreground you see uh, duff plumbing in the middle ground and you can see on the right hand side there's the viaduct with the trail and you can see how it moves towards the left and there's the big old freight yard which was a septa parking lot that's kind of in the middle in the distance so that's what it looks like today this is what it's going to look like in about three years it's a little bit hard to see in the background, but the road is widened out, and you can see that it's that grassy linear park that Susan was sort of talking about, um, that our designers are kind of, uh, our landscape architects in-house are working on design for Susan. Um, you can kind of see, if you, if you look a little closely, there's the trail connections between a sidewalk on the south side of Lafayette and the new trail. The trail shifted towards the septic uh, tracks, as Susan was talking about. Um, Duff Plumbing remains. We're not going to uh, acquire his business or anything. It's a, a good, solid uh, tax-paying business in Norristown. We're leaving them alone. But you can see nothing changes for them, except that you know the viaduct is gone. They don't have that big wall behind their, their facility anymore. And then you can see the freight station in the foreground. Uh, you can see that, that the big wall that was there on the right side, see that big wall on the viaduct? It's gone. It's replaced with a terrace stepped area so people can get from the uh, trail into the, the freight station area. Um, you can see how the Chester Valley Trail comes around the front along Lafayette Street and wraps around in the back and meets with the Schuylkill River Trail. Um, one of the things that is kind of part of this project but not quite is the freight station. Uh, this project is going to do a lot. It's going to build the trail. It's going to build a lot of the green space around the trail because it's, it's connected with Lafayette Street. You, we can do it under this project. Uh, we can do everything on the back side as well, um, thanks to our, our friends at Federal Highway Administration. What we can't do, though, is rehab the building under this project. So the county continues to look for grant funding and use some of its own capital budget money to invest in uh, turning that building into basically a freight station, freight junction center is what we call it, a, a, a facility for trail users on both trails who can come in. Um, well, uh, our plan at this point, uh, we, uh, we've been talking about a, a ranger station or a guard station to help with safety, um, a bike lock. Uh, 
bike racks, pump stations, refreshments, things that will attract trail users to, because there's really no parking on that parcel. It makes it hard to farm it out for a business because businesses like to have on-site parking. It's a very constrained site. It doesn't really work. It's close to the intersection. But what we can do is make it a facility for trail users to use. And let me tell you, those DVRPC numbers I talked about, that um, the, 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 the average daily traffic for the trail, so to speak, Schuylkill River Trail on this point it has almost 1,000 riders a day. The next highest trail is the Chester Valley Trail in Chester County. And those folks are going to have the ability to come up from Chester County, come in here and connect. This freight station is going to be a huge jewel in the crown of our region's trail network, and it's going to be right here in downtown Norristown. So I, I think this is a really good picture to look at, but um, the other one that I want to show is at ground level. Now this is at Walnut Street, look in the other direction. So you can see in the background, there's a SEPTA garage, that five, six story structure towering in the middle. Um, that's what it looks like today. You can see the, the, the beat up pavement, uh, you can see the viaduct there, uh, row homes on the right, and this is what it's going to look like when we're done with it. Viaduct's gone. Green median. That's the trail on the left. It's a little bit hard to see, but the trail is maybe three or four feet above the elevation of the roadway, and that's just because of what the natural terrain is. But you know, you can see there are people and they're going back and forth between the street and the trail. They can park on the street, they can get to the trail that way, they come into downtown Norristown, and we make it a much nicer road. And notice that sidewalk on the right. That sidewalk is much, much bigger than what it was. So those homes, they have a much more walkable and pedestrian and, and house-friendly street to live on. And those are some examples of some of the uh, improvements that we will be making through this project. One other note that I want to make for everybody here is that Lafayette Street is your street. It's Norristown owned. And when we're done with it, it's going to remain Norristown owned. So, um, you know, one of the things that we had to do in the first phase, because we extended it and the extension started in Norristown, is um, under PennDOT guidelines, we had to enter into some agreements with Norristown uh, that uh, would allow Norristown to accept uh, responsibility and ownership of the improvements we make, because they're, we're basically we're building it on your behalf. And so um, there are a couple more that we have to sign for this third phase as well. They're essentially the same documents as what everybody signed the first phase, um, but it's a requirement from PennDOT, and it's just a legal document that basically says, hey, you know, we, we bought the streetlights, and now we got to turn them over to Norristown because we're giving them to you. So at some point, uh, I believe staff will be taking those agreements to council for approval. And uh, after that, the commissioners will then approve it. Everyone will sign it. And like I said, we did this on the first phase, but we've done it with Plymouth on the second phase, and we've got to come back and do it again uh, with Norristown on the third phase. So with that said, I'd be happy to answer any questions that council might have tonight. Olivia. Thank you so much. It's such an exciting project. Um, the question I had was regarding the Lafayette Street widening. As we did with 202, there were a number of public meetings that were um, basically designed to inform the public as to what was going to be done and get feedback from them as to potential issues that they might have. Or is this project going to uh, put those kinds of meetings in place? Yes, uh, actually, Olivia, we've had several of those types of meetings, both here in Norristown and in Plymouth over the years. We had a couple of them. I remember one of the first meetings I went to when I joined the county in the early 2000s, uh, the project was in PE. It was in the environmental assessment stage, which is very early. And I remember we had a public meeting up at the Human Services Center in their big conference room. And that was the first one that I remember attending. There might have been some before that. But since then, every couple of years, uh, especially as we were working through final design in the early stages of that in about 2000, 2008, 2009, we did hold a couple of public meetings here in Norristown to get people's feedback, and that has actually informed some of the design. Uh, some of the parking spaces that you would see on this image, like I said, it's tough to see here, but if you went up to that board, you'd see them. Um, we made sure that we put parking spaces in certain places because the residents and the businesses asked for it. Um, they told us they were concerned about uh, you know, the, the sidewalk and everything, and, and, and so that's why in some ways we have a, a wider sidewalk. They're worried about the traffic impacts. Um, so we have done a lot of that outreach over the years. Um, but I will add, Olivia, that one of the things we did on the second phase in Plymouth, which was very successful, was after the project was, was uh, bid and let, and we had a contractor on board, we had a public meeting to let everybody know of what the construction staging would be so that they're aware that, hey, you know, we'd be closing this side of Ridge Pike first and then this other side because we had a lot of businesses out in that area and some residents too. And I, I, I anticipate that we'll do the same thing for Norristown so that the businesses and residents on Lafayette know, hey, you know, the road might be closed here or there. You know, it'll be a two-year thing and we can answer any questions with the contractor in the room. So that's why I anticipate doing at the very end closer to construction. You're welcome. 
Um, Hakeem. During the construction part of this, uh, oh. piggybacking off of what Olivia said, you have a couple side streets. Um, you have about three side streets that go, you know, from Lafayette all the way down. Are they in the construction part of this also? No, the side streets will not be touched. Okay. Um, can you go back a page? Yeah, wh which one, Derek? Uh, the first page that you were on. The phase. This one or the one before it? Okay, so we have phase one of this. Um, in phase one, um, who, who's currently doing the project? Do we know who's doing uh, Phase one was our project. One, two, and three are being uh, done and funded by the federal government and Montgomery County. And one is done, but it's not opened because it doesn't connect yet to Diamond Avenue. But it's complete, and we did it uh, in 2013 and 2014. All right. Um, do, do we have any Norristown residents with trade that are currently on any of these projects, or will they ever be on any of these projects? Um, I can't speak to where the people live who are the contractors. I can tell you that being a federal aid project, um, the entire project is, uh, 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 I forget the term off the top of my head, it's basically living wage, standard wage, um, you know, the federal wage rates, sorry, what was that? Prevailing wage. prevailing wage, thank you. It, I don't know why it escaped my mind. The project being having federal money is prevailing wage, um, and the contractors also, also have to meet a 10% uh, DBE requirement too. So I don't really know, I, I don't have a list, I don't know where they pull people from. Um, there may very well be Norristown residents that are hired by the subs or the prime uh, to work on it. I just don't have that information, unfortunately. That shows the like the ample theater, ample theater area and right there. Um, on the other side of those train tracks, there is a a long alleyway that kind of goes past the water company and some garages. Um, I believe that's still considered Norristown, and I was wondering what will happen with those areas, as well as the areas that are. I would say the f closer you get to phase one. You'll see the old warehouses on um, East Main Street. You'll see the old textile building. Um, I'm trying to figure out what kind of maybe potential businesses or development can take place in those areas. Yeah. Um, it sounds like, Hakeem, that's a two-part question, so I'll try to answer it in two parts. That's all right. Uh, the first part, you were asked about Washington Street. Um, Washington Street is not part of our project, so we will not be making any changes to that. It's about 20 feet wide, and it serves as good access for the riverfront there. Um, so the only thing that will be involved with Washington Street is, is the signal that Susan was discussing at Ford Street. We have to make sure that that signal uh, uh, works to clear out any traffic that might be coming down Washington, making a left to get to Ford, because they're going to have to cross train tracks. And there, as you know, SEPTA and Norfolk Southern operate trains on that daily. So we have to make sure that our signals allow for that whole Washington Street area to clear and anyone on the tracks get out before a train comes. Um, that's really the limit of Washington Street's impact with our project. Uh, the other part of your question, Akeem, I believe, was the, uh, the former factories that are mostly now offices uh, that line East Main Street and they back up to Lafayette Street. Um, some of those are uh, their backyards meet up with Lafayette at grade, and we've actually had discussions with one or two of them about getting access to it. Uh, we sort of put them on hold because, like I said, uh, you know, this is going to be Norristown Street, and we want uh, you guys to have a say in really, you know, how these businesses connect. So some of them can make that connection, but we'll let uh, municipal officials decide, you know, whether or not uh, to allow that as a policy. Other ones, though, they're actually a lot lower than the street, and so there's really no way for them to connect. Um, so the re the revitalization piece of this might end up being hit or miss unless certain property owners decide to invest in the earthworks needed to meet up with that street. But generally, um, our street that we've built uh, does not have those connections in it. And if they want to connect to Lafayette Street, they will have to go through the, uh, the municipal HOP process.
Yeah, so, so, so the ones in this picture, Hakeem, where you have, uh, you have metalworks companies and uh, automotive companies on the north side near the homes, those will continue to have their driveway accesses. Um, but the ones like the, the Rambo and Regar mill building, um, those ones down there, uh, they do not have access right now. And if they want to, it will be a municipal policy whether or not to open that up to them or to remain closed to keep traffic flowing. How, how much is this project going to be? How much to build all of this? Um, phase three will cost estimated $35 million, and that's construction only. So the $85 million I put out there, uh, that included constructions for phase one, phase two, phase three, um, plus design costs, plus rival acquisition, plus utility relocation. All of that together comes to 85, but just to build phase three, construction only should be about $35 million. Great. Thank you, Ms. President. <laughs> Madam Secretary, do we have, I'm sorry, Mr. Perry, do we have any announcements this evening? Yes. Um, Okay, the first one is you're invited to a black history celebration on Saturday, March 5th, 2016 at 4 p.m. It's at St. Augustine's Episcopal Church, 1208 Green Street in Norristown, Pennsylvania. Uh, come and enjoy presentations by Judge Cheryl Austin of Montgomery County, Mount Zion AME Church Choir, Norristown High School Gospel Choir, history and song as presented by many others. Um, it's a free will offering and refreshments will follow the program. Uh, you can also park in the OIC parking lot uh, located at 200, the 200 block of Basin Street. We also have tomorrow a town hall meeting uh, sponsored by Councilwoman Valerie Scott Cooper in the third district. Uh, the guest speaker will be Sarah Peck in regards to a new project that will be on um, DeKalb Street. This will be at the library, and it is from 6 p.m. to 7.30 p.m. Please come out. Um, SEPTA has uh, scheduled a series of public meetings for the King of Prussia Rail Project. Also, um, we would have to get more information in regards to that. Uh, that is at um, Municipal Hall, March 9th, 2016, from 4 to 8 p.m. And we have Theater Horizon, which will present Lobby Hero. This will go from February 18th to March 13th. It is by Kenneth Longerin, directed by Matthew Decker. Um, please come out, and that's it. Thank you, Councilman Perry. Madam Secretary, do we have any public comments? Yes, Percy Thompson. Hello and thank you. Uh, my first complaint is about. Um, could, excuse me, could you please state your name and your address? Uh, Percy Thompson, 205 Eastwood Street. Um, public, public works, public works, I guess we call it public safety, whoever it is, public works. Um, I, would, I visited them three times for potholes, they took care of the situation. Second time was uh, during the snow. I had a, a funeral, and they brought the sidewalk up before the funeral came, so I had to shovel it myself. But they had to put the body in the in the, um, in the parking lot and take it from the parking lot to the church, up the steps. Blah, blah, blah. So we took care of it. The third time was I needed some um, street lights done. So as I was walking up the steps, you know, they got the mirror sitting up there, and I hear him saying, oh, here he come again. I said, oh, okay. I just let it go in my head, so I explained it. And it's been over a month before when you get a street light put, on, uh, put up. Now, street light hasn't been done yet. Now I notice I got two street lights out, and it still hasn't been done. It's, um... What's the location again? It's right behind the, um... It's, uh, it's, it's alleyway right behind the Asylum Baptist Church. Um, 
right behind the, um, the parking lot where the hospital was, between um, Powell Street and, and uh, Willow. Between, um, Wood Street and yeah. Finance, I guess that's where it is. Finance Street, I guess. I don't know what, what the other side is. Yep, that's Finance. Mm -hmm. So now, now I got two, the whole alley's dark now. It's cause now, now it's another street laid out. So now it's, it's a dark period back there. You know, I, we got, we got um, events back there at nighttime, stuff back there. So when I mean, people come back at the nighttime, you're just walking outside in the dark back there. All right. My other complaint was uh, park, parking permits. Um, where, I, where I live at, you need a parking permit to park, you know, to where you live at. Um, I had no problem having a parking permit on my car, but it's just a joke because uh, they ticket where they want to ticket and they ticket who they want to ticket. They said, first of all, when they first did this stuff, it says it's because of the hospital. Then it said, oh, now it's because of uh, the old Sacred Heart building. Well, they have a parking garage, but they don't want to pay for the parking garage, so either you get a parking permit or they're going to park in your parking spaces. Well, I called them up and I told them, I said, well, I need a parking space. Well, they told me, uh, they came out, the uh, parking bill, I thought they came out and told me, what else a parking space down there? Well, I said, well, I live down the street right here. I said, there's eight, there's eight cars sitting here with no parking permit. And I didn't say you ticket none of these cars out here, but with my cars out here, you were ticket me. And they just kept on rolling. I said, well, don't put a ticket on my car if you can't ticket nobody else's car. Well, New Year comes around, there's a ticket on my car. I go around to um, Sacred Heart Hospital, I see the same cars out here with no, no stickers, no nothing. I don't see no ticket on none of these cars out here. So, I, I, like I said, it's just a joke with this parking permit. I don't care less about where you park, I park at. I care less to, to be honest, I can, I can I'm authorize a handicapped parking space. I have one, I'm authorized two, to be honest, for one car and for another car. But I don't want to do my, my neighbors justice by taking up all these uh, parking spaces. Because I can park where I want to, anywhere I want to. I mean, I can walk where I want to walk at and park somewhere else. But it's just something I'm saying, you know, you, you take up my car just when, just because I don't have a sticker, but you ain't sticking nobody else's cars when you need to. You know what I mean? I mean, I just, yeah, I, I just say, uh, you should be around, uh, hanging around at that place over there and putting tickets on that, on that car over there since that's where the, uh, the main reason why uh, we got parking permits. That's where you, that's where you should be able to ride around that, riding around that neighborhood. Mr. Jones, could we um, have someone check into that and do some research in regards to the parking tickets? Absolutely. Please. Thank you. I appreciate it. No Thank problem. Thanks. Thank you. Madam Councilman Milner. I had a question about what you shared when you came up and spoke. Um, you talked about a situation involving a funeral. Yes. I just wanted to clarify if you were talking about you had a, a funeral service that involved your personal family. No, or, I had, no being that I'm a, I had opened the church up for the day for the funeral. And being that it was a snow, it, it was during the snowstorm. And what church was that? Salon. Salon, okay, okay, yes. And then it was a snow day. Uh, the funeral was canceled. It was supposed to be Monday, so it was canceled because of the snow. So no problem. Uh, I went to them. I went to them, and they told me uh, being there was Friday at two o'clock. We close. You know, we done working for the day. And I said, well, we, but they said um, if we open, if we work tomorrow, then we we're cleaning for you. So. As in the street in front of. Uh, in front of, Willow in front, in front of, of Silo. In other words, the snow got pushed all up on all up on the right. You know, but so in other words, what we did, we just we just called our people who did our parking lot and just called them up and just did it. Cause when you say if we working, they're not telling me you ain't working Saturday. So I called our people and then just tell them our people just can you come up and and, and uh, you know do our do our sidewalk again. on that Saturday. On that no uh, on that Monday. So we on that Monday. Yeah. So we had to, what uh, date was that? Well, it was during the snowstorm, so I can't say that. I uh, say what, like the 24th, 25th, something like that. Uh, okay. You know what I mean? So we had the funeral that Tuesday. You know what I'm yes, sir. So we had the but we still had the body parked in the uh, parking lot. 
and then that brought about the, the, you know, brought, you know, instead of just having the bodies parked in front of the church and bring the correct, in, you know, yes, you to, and then, I mean, I'm just saying, you know, but you know, you're telling me that. But then, uh, like I said, what I told you, the street light. And I, now I went for the street lights. You even had the, the the truck out there with the buggy, even parked outside. Ten guys sitting downstairs, four or five guys sitting in the office with him, saying, "Oh, here he come again." When I started to go off on him and say, "Here he coming." I, I hear you. I didn't say nothing. Yes, you know. I understand. I just wanted to clarify. I just wanted to understand that's the piece cool. about the funeral. I now, I, I now I, understand. I haven't went back up there, but it's been over a month, and I still ain't got no lights. But now, like I say, there's another one off. You know, it's still dark. It's dark back there, so I'm just saying. All right. Okay. Appreciate Thank it. you. Thank you. The next order of business we have is planning and the municipal development. Will that be Mr. Jones doing the introduction of the presentation, or will that be Ms. Masanya? Uh, gladly, President Sanders. Um, we do have the Audubon uh, Society here to, with us tonight. We were very encouraged by the proposal they had sent to us, I think a couple of weeks ago, uh, seeking funds to help with improving our parks as well as involving the youth in that whole exercise. We thought that that was an excellent opportunity, so we asked um, the Audubon Society to come and uh, do a presentation to council and if council could give the blessings uh, for whether uh, they were interested in the, the Audubon Society uh, pursuing this grant uh, on behalf of the municipality uh, to help us with the parks as well as involving the youth in improving our parks. Uh, we have um, Carrie Barron who has a presentation and um, hopefully you'll be able to get a little more detail from after her presentation, if it works. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you all for having me today. I'm very excited to be here and tell you about this uh, project. And in front of you, you all should have the exact same uh, program and PowerPoint that I'm going to be presenting today so you can get a closer look at it. Um, my name is Carrie Barron. I'm the assistant director at the John James Audubon Center, which is just about 10 minutes away from here in Audubon, Pennsylvania. Um, so today I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, who we are and why we're so excited about coming into to Norristown and hopefully engaging your community. Uh, so Audubon itself, National Audubon Society, you might think it's just about the birds. It actually isn't. Um, I'm going to read you our mission statement, which hopefully will allow you to understand why I'm here today. So our mission is to conserve and restore natural ecosystems, focusing on birds, other wildlife, and their habitats for the benefit of humanity. It's not just for birds. We believe that a healthy ecosystem for birds is going to be a healthy ecosystem for people. And so if you look at this housing map from uh, 1940, you see the uh, open space that used to be available, open space for humans and also open space for birds. If we project out, look at 2030, as you can see the East Coast, which we are a part of, has very, very little open space. And that's what's concerning to us. It's the fact that we don't have these natural areas um, that we once did that really preserve our quality of life. So this used to be a bird's eye view of Norristown. And so as a bird, if you were coming back from a mig uh, migratory path, a migration from South or Central America, you're very tired, you're looking for a place to land and you're looking for something to eat. Uh, there used to be plenty of places. Um, now, if you were a bird and you're flying over Norristown, you are looking for small patches of places to land. And of course, Norristown is, is like any other urban environment. Um, um, lots and lots of housing, not as much natural open space. And even the places that are open, those are oftentimes grass, just plain grass mowed grass. Um, birds really don't thrive on grass. Grass doesn't provide the kind of plants that insects need to survive. And so what we have been doing, and we've been doing it successfully in your elementary schools, is actually doing plantings of native plants. These are plants that were here in Norristown before the colonialization 
of this area. These are plants that belong here. They're plants that the insects have learned how to use and digest. The insects being the bottom of our food chain, the plants providing the food for the insects, the insects providing the food for the birds and the butterflies and everything else as you move up the food chain. And so what we decided to do is put these pocket little beds and, and parks of native plants throughout the Norristown community. And it's proven to be extremely successful. We started out five years ago. And the first school we were in is Marshall Street Elementary. We went into Marshall Street um, without any funding, just because I really, truly believe that this would um, become a successful program. And we put in these beds. So as you can see, we're not talking about extensive areas. Um, this would have been a newly planted bed. Um, and what we do in these schools right now, uh, Currently, we're in Marshall Street, Gottwalls, and Whitehall Elementary. Um, we put in native plant beds at all of the schools. We do multiple programming throughout the year for the fourth graders, all STEM-based. They're all um, labs that we do. We do water quality testing. We do biology. We bring things into the classroom that the teachers simply don't have the ability to purchase, or sometimes as an elementary student or teacher have the knowledge to teach that type of education, um, scientific inquiry. So we do fourth grade programs throughout the year, but we also go in and we do district-wide trainings of all the teachers. So every single teacher in that school can utilize those gardens as an outside classroom. We do auditorium programs so all the students in the school know that these beds exist and see them when they're outside playing. Um, so this has grown significantly. Since we put in the Marshall Street program um, and we added Gottwalls and we added Whitehall, uh, we just recently got a grant from PICO for $15,000, which has allowed us to go into Hancock, Cole Manor, and Musselman. This uh, spring, in April and May, we'll be adding 16 beds to those three schools. We'll be doing programming throughout all of them, just like I spoke um, about before. And in addition, we have added the special needs um, group in the high school who comes and does monthly programs. So that's actually them over at Whitehall. Um, they come across the, uh, the ball fields and come to the Whitehall beds. And just so you know, they're all very cold there. So that's why the plants don't look that great because it's winter time. So in just a couple of months, they start to get huge and big and beautiful. So this program has really, really become successful and not just the ways that the kids are engaged, but we're also engaging the families. Through that PICO grant, every single fourth grader, in addition to going through the program, this spring is coming out to Mill Grove. And not only are we providing the busing for them, we're inviting their families. We are trying to get their families to understand the importance of what we're doing at their schools and how they can do these in their own backyards, no matter what kind of backyard it is, whether it's pavement, whether there's nothing, whether they have a little tiny patch, all of these little tiny areas are stopover habitats that when you put them together as a greater whole is really, really meaningful. So what, why am I here today? Um, so we do have the ability to get a $100,000 grant from Impact 100. Uh, we will find out in the next few weeks if we're one of the finalists. We will get the final um, okay in June if we do get the money. Even if we don't, we still would like to proceed with the project that I'm speaking to you about today. Um, if we do get the money, in addition to me uh, jumping up and down for a couple of days, um, we will be doing a lot more um, intensive work, but uh, we want to start small and build from there. So here's Barone Park. Um, why we picked this park is because of the fact of where it's located. We love that it's not too far from some of our partners. Um, Aclamo. Uh, we also work with the uh, Montgomery County um, Association for the Blind, MCIU, the Head Start. These are all areas that, um, and organizations that don't necessarily have schoolyards or places for us to put these gardens in. So what's a better place than a park that's centrally located that we'd be able to walk 
kids and families too. Um, I do have a picture of a tree swallow there. A tree swallow is a bird that if you look up in the right hand side, it spends its summer with us and it migrates all the way down to Central um, America. And why we love this is because this bird relies on insects, insects that need those native plants to survive. And because of the large Hispanic population in Norristown, especially working with the Clamo, we want to connect a bird that made possibly the same journey that some of these families have to understand what it is like as you move across and all of the challenges of a migration and allowing it to come to a place where it really can live, survive, and thrive. So there will be some key species that we'll be looking at. So here's what I propose, and it's not a huge beginning, but hopefully we can expand off of that. Here is the current park, and this wouldn't even occur to the fall because we wouldn't get the funding till the summer, and you really don't want to plant until the fall. So what I am proposing, and this would be fully funded by us, um, would require no money um, from the council or, or the city of Norristown. Um, so we would construct six of these raised garden beds. What we have found is when we do the raised garden beds in the school, it makes for very, very easy maintenance. The worst thing you need is a weed whacker. Everything is contained inside. Um, and so what we do is we build the beds, we fill them full of soil, we put um, matting down underneath so you're not running into weeds, we plant the native plants. We do about 15 to 20 native plants per bed. Here is what's so amazing about these plants. We'll have to water them once we first get them in the ground, but after that they don't need anything. These plants are used to living in Pennsylvania. They're used to the cold, they're used to the, the droughts, they're used to everything. Unlike a lawn that you need to water, these things have been built to be able to resist all of the climatic changes that we have. So after we water them for a few months, that's all you need to do. Our staff is going to be on a weekly basis working with the community. Every week we will be in that park. We'll be making sure that if it needs to be cut back, it's cut back. If it needs mulching, it's mulch. But more importantly, it's not just us, it's us gaining the community's uh, kind of uh, excitement and engagement around this project. Now, you might think, okay, maybe um, this sounds a little out there with native plants, but not only is it benefiting just the fact of birds, this benefits people. It gets people to increase their physical health because they're taking a walk to this park to see something. And you see flowers, it makes you happy. It increases mental health. It saves money because you don't have to mow those areas. And the more of that that you have, the less that you, the more of those meadows that you have and that na native plants, the less kind of work you have to do. And I actually have a small case study um, because before I moved up here, I used to live in Philadelphia. And when I lived in Philadelphia, I uh, started a green club program at a charter school called Mastery Charter School in South Philly. And when I started that program, they had two empty lots on the side of their school, always filled with garbage. And so I started with one lot, and I put in a few of these beds. And all of a sudden, what you saw is they had neighbors all facing the school, all around the sides. These neighbors started caring. They started caring about garbage being in front of their house because they were looking at these beautiful garden beds and they were seeing birds there. And they were coming over and asking us, well, why are you doing this and what are you doing? And they saw the kids involved and the kids, these are middle and high school kids that were going ahead and talking to the adults about what they were doing. I had one of my students, they started in eighth grade. He went all the way up through 12th grade with me. He's out in California right now. He's a Gates Millennium Scholar, and he spends his summer in LA doing the same kind of programming, reaching out to kids in the city, teaching them about nature. This is the kind of success that I want to see. And even if it's just one or two people that get inspired, that's enough for me. Um, so we will involve the community in the planting. And here's another case study in Baltimore. We have a park called Patterson Park. They started putting in those beds there, and the neighbors started to get excited. And that's what I want people to see. Look at this little tiny backyard filled with plants. 
filled with visitors. And this leads directly into citizen science because there are things out there like Nest Watch, Project Feeder Watch, eBird, that are so easy for anyone with an iPhone, computer, tablet, something that most of us have, um, to be able to enter data. And that data is used to tell us all about the populations of animals and what a great way to engage teenagers is talking to them about real things that matter and how they can make an impact. And finally, being bird friendly is being climate friendly. Um, having these extra plants directly reduces greenhouse gas, increases carbon storage, and it builds resilient bird populations. But more importantly, it really connects Norristown to the greater Atlantic Flyway. It makes people think that they're a part of a bigger solution and it really empowers people that even if they're not changing 100 acres, their small part is really making a huge difference. So questions, yes. Thank you so much. I really love this kind of stuff. As a matter of fact, one of these birds comes to visit me. I don't know who he is, but- A goldfinch. <laughs> he comes in my yard. Um, the reason, um, the qu one question I had is regarding the residents on Bar near Barone Park. Sure. I had another constituent come and rec um, talk about the possibility of doing community gardens there. And he faced a little bit of resistance from the neighbors who were concerned primarily with the um, potential for unwelcome guests, meaning pests that could possibly invade their homes. So what kind of outreach are you going to be doing with the community? I know you mentioned that you were going to have the community involved in helping planting and um, working with that, but could you touch a little bit more on how you would engage the residents of that area? Sure. So um, one thing is being a part of a national organization is really nice is th this program, which is called the Native Plant Initiative, um, which is run out of our national office in New York, has done these throughout the country. So we have the ability to say and show areas where this has occurred and that there aren't these unwanted um, pests. Also, I do need to tell you that what I'm proposing are native plants. They're not vegetables, they're not. So the kind of maybe small mammals that they may not be wanting um, aren't really attracted to what we're planting. What we're planting is really gonna be things. The only thing that might be attracted is a deer, but for a deer to get to where that is would be <laughs> quite an amazing feat. So, um, so we don't have the same kind of concerns because the plants that we're planting are not really things that uh, you know, uh, rats would eat, um, or you know, even squirrels may. But that uh, the other thing is, is that if a squirrel is going to eat that, they're going to be there anyways. Um, those animals, and and it might just be a little bit of education, education about the fact that. Um, the, the dynamics and the, the demographics of the animals that are there, an animal that's never lived there before isn't all of a sudden going to come because of that. Birds will and insects will because they can fly and they can be in flight and see that, but gra ground mammals typically will not. So it, it will be um, education. Also the really exciting thing is we have both our uh, website as well as, t as our native plant guides and plant guides both in Spanish and in English. So any signage that we would have in the park which would actually be in the beds themselves so that wouldn't be additional to go around all signs would be in English Spanish and in Braille yes, I have a question here um, will the children have an opportunity to to plant an actual seed and watch it grow so that they'll understand it doesn't come as a plant first. And my second question is, I understand staff will be maintaining the beds. Will the children have an opportunity to see how it's supposed to be maintained and perhaps have their fingers in it just a little bit so they can see it doesn't just grow weedless? So when we applied for this original grant, um, I wanted to set up partners in advance to make sure that if we got the money, we could go up and running. So one of our strong partners is Aclamo. With Aclamo, we have decided that we will be in their after school program once a week. And that means taking the students that go there after school and actually bringing them to that garden to work on the garden. So they will have their hands in there. Um, in addition, what we do in the other sc schools and the classrooms is we do little seed plantings, we send those 
home. Um, and so we hope that those end up actually becoming something at their home that becomes something that the whole family wraps their, their um, excitement around. We do sometimes go from seed to the garden, but what we find is um, oftentimes we have more die off if we do that. So we do seeds as an idea of what you can do and how it grows. And we talk about the biology behind it, um, but every single one of our plantings, that is done by the community or kids. We're there to talk about it, but we're not the ones. We build it, but then they install those plants. I have a question and a comment, so I'd like a very short answer to the question. How did, we, how did you ID Thomas Barone Park? Okay, um, my son goes to the MCIU and um, uh, he's four years old. And so I spent a lot of time around, looking around the neighborhoods after I'd gone to Aclamo, after I'd talked to the uh, Montgomery County Association and looked for a place that seemed central. It seemed like within walking distance didn't seem like it had to cross any major roads. And it looked like something that was an empty space that could use this to really rejuvenate it. And so it was really me driving around uh, during the two hours he's at the MCIU and scouting. OK, great. Um, so I want to echo slightly differently. Uh, I certainly uh, try to be ecologically friendly and understand as I was sharing with my colleague here, the whole circle of life ideas. Um, but one of the things about Norristown is uh, residents don't often respond well to the notion that any organization of any type with any project has done X, Y, and Z in urban environments across the country. So I'm not skeptical. I'm just talking about what I've seen on the ground. We've uh, I did tree planting at what is called Thomas Barone Park six years ago. So um, I would support this project if we identified one of our more clearly defined parks. There's a park on James Street uh, in the West End. If you're attracted to the West End because Aklamo is in what is known as the West End of Norristown, um, there is a park. Um, I want to say off of Hamilton, off of Main Street, and someone here may recall the name of that park uh, before I do, but there's, these are small, I, clearly identified parks, meaning they, they may have a basketball court, they may have playground equipment, um, and because they're clearly identified as municipal property, uh, I think you're going to have an easier time gaining acceptance from residents. Because of my own experience, uh, working at the Thomas Barone site and at other municipally owned sites that are in essence vacant lots like the larger Barone site. Um, while Aklamo is in the community, in that immediate neighborhood, um, I know people that live on Thomas Barone and I can assure you that um, well-intentioned or not, misinformed or not, um, there are going to be concerns about a project that's not fundamentally rooted in the actual residents on Thomas Barone, for which, for example, are only the units across the street, for example. So um, I commend it. I think it's great. But because of what I've seen specifically go down in Norristown, um, if you've interfaced with municipal administration on this matter, I mean, there are at least two other municipally owned parks you know, in the West End, um, which might be uh, better suited and you'd be more likely to in fact not just not get neighborhood opposition but actually get neighborhood participation because the idea would be I mean I know we call it Thomas Perone Park but other than it being an empty lot there's nothing that actually signifies that it's a park where these other two sites community recognizes them as parks and a project like this would seem um, more consistent with one might, with what one might do in a park. And I am totally that, that I am totally up for that. There's nothing that has secured, you know, made me say that this is where um, I kind of did it on my own um, without. We needed to get the grant in. I wanted to make sure that there was an aspect of the community involved. So again, I would be. 
totally open to something that you felt was, that is the idea, is to get the community around it um, and not to have the community not feel like it's part of it. So um, if that is, is what you feel and the, the council feels, I would be very, I'd be fine with that. All right, there you go. Um, thank you for the presentation. Uh, and I think it's great that you are partnering with not just one, not two, but many of our uh, district schools. And, and the fact that you've been able to obtain additional funding to serve even, even more kids is, is great. Um, it's good to have someone come into Norristown. Um, and I don't 100% agree with Marlon, but I think an area like Thomas Brown is, is highly concentrated with children. Um, it is an urban area, um, and, and it, it is a good example of giving these kids ways to uh, take ownership of their community, um, where in most cases there's a lot of litter. There's um, less appreciation for you know the front steps and for the walkways. So I think the area is, is pretty decent, but just commend you for coming and getting involved with not just the children, but the schools and the the overall so thank you and um we just uh were able to get dr samuels on our board at mill grove so um that has really given us a lot of support to continue getting into the schools um and expanding that you know we always feel it's easiest to start with the children and then build up from there um and and get them excited and pull their parents and the and the families in so um thank you so much for your time i'm not sure exactly um where i go from here <laughs> but um, what I will do is um, I will look at some of the other possibilities and as soon as we know a little bit more about our funding um, I will make sure and reach out and let you know and I hope that you all will keep your fingers crossed for us and finally um, just a little plug if you uh, have uh, any no plans on Saturday we have a free family festival called the Sapsucker Festival um, at our site and it's wonderful it's a great way to eat some pancakes and uh, get to see our owls. So um, I invite you all out to that and thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I too think it's an awesome project having the youth involved and more importantly having Dr. Samuels involved and I too agree that having the youth involved in the participation in the community of Narstown is very important. So I greatly appreciate it. Thank, thank you. you. Madam, Madam President, if, if you will, uh, I think because they're trying to get a grant application in and they'd like some indication of support. I think in, in hearing the comments of council, certainly staff can work with, uh, work with them in terms of ultimately identifying a site. But I think a motion, if council is, is, is uh, so desires, would be in order tonight to uh, support or not to support the project so that they can proceed and include that in their application. And we can then prepare them a letter saying, with the minutes saying that council does support the project. Would a member of council like, I'm sorry. Yes, I'd like, to, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the project. Discussion. Mr. Miller. Thank you. Um, I think if the motion were amended to say Norristown rather than specify Thomas Perone Park, I certainly would be satisfied and inclined to support the project. I accept that change. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it, and that motion is approved. The next order of business, Ms. Massonnier, will you be presenting that? Or Mr. Jones? To the solicitors, uh, to uh, present this, uh, but this is the uh, next step, um, Madam uh, Council Members, in uh, moving toward the uh, blighted uh, property review committee. And uh, so tonight we're asking uh, Council to consider uh, making an appointment um, of a Council Member to the committee. Um, Sean, if you'll. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Jones. Uh, the Blighted Property Review Committee, uh, current council may not be that familiar with it. Um, 
Uh, several years ago, actually twice I was involved in the process as municipal solicitor, whereby code goes out and looks at uh, blighted and dilapidated properties uh, within Norristown. They work uh, with our local uh, planning commission as well as representatives of the Montgomery County Redevelopment Authority to identify these properties and certify them as blighted and then put the owners on notice uh, that they are blighted and uh, go through all the legal proceedings, even leading to the possibility of condemnation related to, to these properties. We have, we have, in fact, not done condemnation in Norristown, basically for financial resources, but other uh, boroughs like Pottstown does occasionally uh, do that, and it's a nice tool for Norristown to have to incentivize landlords that are not keeping up their properties to do so. We, of course, work with uh, property owners uh, to make sure that uh, it's not an older lady uh, that may have, may have problems. We're identifying people that have multiple blighted properties and going through the legal processes to go through. Uh, being that we hadn't done this in a while, uh, Council sees that there was a 2005 ordinance uh, that I drafted at the time, and you have to appoint uh, essentially four representatives. Uh, one uh, from the County Redevelopment Authority, which has been Jerry Nugent historically, um, the Municipal Administrator's designee, uh, the Planning Commission member, which I believe is Mr. Anderson, and, and a council member who in the past had been Councilman Caldwell, who of course left us this past December. Uh, so there's a resolution for council to consider uh, to go ahead and insert a name of a current council member that would like to serve on this and then adopt a resolution by roll call if council so chooses. Thank you, Mr. Solicitor. At this time, I would like to make a motion to approve appointing Councilman Marlon Milner. To <laughs> I said there's going to be discussion, Mr. Milner. <laughs> I mean, I just find it odd that, I mean, this is the first I'm hearing of this. Actually, what is this? What are the duties? You sit on a committee. Uh, essentially, code goes ahead and triages various properties uh, within Norristown to find out the levels of blight. Under the urban redevelopment law, there's criteria of what constitutes blight. Then you will serve on a committee to evaluate this and determine if uh, the municipality and, uh, moves forward on a blight certification of these properties. And who else serves on this? Uh... Uh, well, it had previously been Mr. Caldwell, and there needs to be a council member. They have been Jerry Nugent uh, from the County Redevelopment Authority. Uh, there had been a designee of the municipal administrator or the municipal administrator, and a representative from the Planning Commission, who I believe is Mr. Anderson. And I presume it only meets on an as-needed basis. It only, uh, as I said, um, I've, done a, I've been solicitor 12 years. We've done it twice. So it doesn't, doesn't, didn't happen very often. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? I just got a comment. Comment, Council Member. If it if it was every month, would you would you want to still put it? Down? <laughs> I mean, no, it sounds fine. I I just thought there would be some advance notice. Madam Secretary, may we have roll call, please? Marlon Milner? Aye. Livy Brady? Aye. Valerie Scott Cooper? Heather Lewis? Aye. Hakeem Jones? Aye. Derek Perry? Aye. Sonia Sanders? Aye. So Marlon Milner will fill the vacated seat of former council member William Codwell <coughs> to a two-year term, and that term will expire January 2018. Mr. Solicitor, will you also be explaining the design review board as well? Uh, yes, I, I will. Uh, council has in their packet a, um, a resolution to approve um, members of the uh, design review board. The design review board is in the, in the Norristown ordinances, which basically uh, charges members of the design review board to go ahead and make sure that we're keeping up uh, aesthetically in how Norristown should look, the character of the community in, in, in conjunction with the land development and zoning process. 
Um, currently, it's a five-member board. Uh, the council member position is vacant. Uh, Hugh McGee uh, has served, serves on it from the Planning Commission. Uh, Walter Wyckoff serves on it from the Development Community. Um, someone, a representative of Mr. Hassan's office at Pannoni, serves on it. And another uh, appointee of Municipal Council um, can serve. Uh, I believe the resolution you, uh, have, uh, you have before you is um, insert a name to fill the vacated, vacated seat of Bill Caldwell, who uh, also served on this committee, and also uh, fill the vacated seat of Susan Howard, who previously served on the uh, committee. Olivia, Councilwoman Olivia Brady. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to submit my name to replace that, uh, Bill, Mr. Caldwell. Any discussion or questions? Madam Secretary, may I have one? I uh, believe, I'm don't sorry. we have the other? Do we, did Council want to go not. ahead and fill the other? No. We, we haven't identified any? Okay, okay, great. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Marlon Milner? Aye. Livia Brady? Aye. Valerie Scott Cooper? Aye. Heather Lewis? Aye. Hakeem Jones? Aye. Derek Perry? Aye. Sonny Sanders? Aye. Councilwoman Olivia Brady will fill the vacated seat of former, former council member Wilm Codwell to a four-year term, and that term will expire up January 2020. So that resolution 16-111 is approved. Next order of business for planning and development is item D. Thank you, uh, Madam President. I come before you, Council, tonight just to inform you that um, the Department of Housing and Urban Development submitted uh, the actual numbers for our CDBG budget. If you will recall, at the last workshop meeting, I had explained to Council that um, the manner in which we submit our applications had changed uh, from just having a previous number where we would send it to uh, HUD for approval. Um, and then wait to see what Congress uh, was going to pass. Um, and usually it took a long time. And this time it kind of caught us off guard because it came sooner than we expected. Uh, we received the new numbers, I, I think it was about a week or two ago. Uh, we have 60 days to, uh, to adjust our budgets. Uh, this particular time, uh, unfortunately, we lost about 5% of the previously uh, sum of, uh, or rather the, the, the amount that we thought we had. Uh, when we submitted the action plan for 2016, we were looking at $812,640 uh, uh, to basically uh, finance the various projects that uh, you have all become very familiar with. Um, HUD sent the new numbers, which are $777,527. Dollars, which meant we had to look at the projects that we had submitted earlier on and uh, make uh, the necessary adjustments whereby um, without affecting the delivery of the projects. Uh, we believe we've been able to do that. Uh, the, the projects that were affected by the cuts uh, include um, administration. Uh, originally, we had allocated $162,528,000 and the new budget for that will be 155505 We're able to do that because we're not carrying a full staff in planning for that matter, so we're able to save on that. Code enforcement, um, the previous allocation was 100,000. Uh, we're proposing it goes down to 80,000. As we all know, we had reduced the number of code enforcement officers, so they will not be affected in terms of um, a delivery. We also um, looked at the housing rehab technical support, where we previously had um, allocated 35,000, and we are asking it to be reduced to 10,000. And you may wonder why. It's because we actually have two years, two previous years that still haven't been touched. Uh, so we do have sufficient uh, technical support funds until next year, uh, and we won't be affected in delivering the housing rehab. Uh, with Main Street, uh, we, we did increase it slightly uh, because, of course, the demand for the Main Street Economic Development Initiative is great, and we're hoping we can attract more uh, business, of course, with that particular initiative. 
So we've been able to um, adjust those uh, allocations and we'll be able to meet the delivery of these projects. Now, uh, as a matter of process, what HUD requires us to do is, of course, uh, come to you as council and introduce those changes. So we're asking council tonight to allow us to advertise that ordinance with those changes, um, wait for 30 days and receive public comment. And when we receive the public comment, then we will have a public hearing at the next uh, meeting after the 30 days where we'll still open it uh, for uh, the public to have their comments with regard to those changes. And everything, if everything is okay and council votes for that, then the application is formally submitted to HUD. But they will expect us to have followed all those steps that I just mentioned. So this is the beginning of the process. So tonight, I'm asking council to allow us to advertise the ordinance as it's presented. Thank you, Ms. Massonier. Would a member of council like to make a motion to approve the advertising of the proposed ordinance to adopt the revised 2016 Community Development Block Grant Action Plan budget? So moved. Second. Question or discussion? Councilman Perry. So um, just to be clear on this, um, because it seems like some of the times, uh, you know, we, we get wrong information uh, being put out there on the forefront. So with previous years, we get to save money in regards to that to do projects that could be coming up in the near present or the near future. Am I correct on that? Um, uh we really never know what we're going to receive. Right. That's, that's the bottom line. It all depends on Congress and how they're going to vote on a, on a budget. The years where we have um, uh, just looked at the previous year's allocation and uh, used that, and sometimes we get the money in, in line with that. Mm -hmm. um, and there are times that it's been slashed real low. Uh, but when we are putting in our action plan, we are always aware that we have that uncertainty. Therefore, um, even though we're proposing those projects, it really depends on what money actually comes in. And the reason why we are advertising it is for that very reason, so that there isn't false information out there. We're saying this is what we thought we were going to have. We advertise that. And when we receive the actual numbers, we come, of course, in front of council. Council approves us advertising it again. So we'll advertise for the, the citizens to know that we're not receiving what we thought we were going to receive, and these are the changes that we're going to, uh, to, to we're proposing, but we'll be able to deliver the projects. Some projects take long, some projects, if they're fully funded, they will, of course, be implemented. So my, my second question is in regards to, is it 9 West Main Street? Is that, yes. Uh, so can, can you give a, a little explanation on how this goes into uh, specifically this uh, CBGG money? Uh, Nine so West, people can understand uh, sure. exactly. By all, by all okay. means, Nine West's uh, funding is was all was all allocated. It's got nothing to do with this money that's coming okay. in. Uh, we cannot uh, get into a contract without have, having the money at hand. So whatever money that is currently going on in um, in the construction of Nine West, we already have it at hand. The budget was set. It is, it's in the works, construction is going on. Hopefully you receive the uh, schedule. We're hoping that we'll be done in April and, and that's how it's taken care of. But it has nothing to do with this 2016 budget. So let's reiterate that one more time. It is for the construction. Yes, it is not, for the construction. And not to the uh, business of that location. No. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. All in favor? Aye. Any nays? Hearing none, the ayes have it, and that motion passes. The next order of business we have is legal. And who will be leading us into that discussion in regards to item A? I believe it's uh, Madam President. Uh, council has before you an ordinance uh, tonight for the taxpayer bill of rights. I believe my colleague, Mr. Carolus, was here last meeting to give a full explanation. He often handles this actually for my law firm. Just briefly explain to council again and to the public exactly what this is. Uh, uh, Norristown and many other municipalities uh, collect a business privilege tax. 
Um, and it's obviously up to that uh, taxpayer, that business, to go ahead and report the results of what they make uh, every year and pay the proper taxes into Norristown. State law has, has realized that often sometimes it's better, uh, not, not to say that we don't have many honest and hardworking businesses, but to go ahead and occasionally do some audits of other businesses, one, to make sure they're paying that, two, sending out a, a message to other businesses that they're supposed to pay what, the Nor what Norristown is entitled to in taxes. Uh, one of the mechanisms to go ahead and do this is to adopt the Taxpayer Bill of Rights. This is not collecting a new tax for Norristown. This is only seeking to enforce the current business privilege tax, which is on the books. So what, has you, what, what is here is essentially uh, the procedures in moving forward, authorizing the program, and then there will be uh, two uh, steps that we'll recommend to the administration. One is an adoption of a subsequent re resolution setting forth all the procedures or related to this. And in turn, uh, what that does is if someone, uh, if someone is not happy with the results of their audit, uh, they can appeal to counsel for relief. Uh, number two is we'll recommend that counsel uh, and administration craft an RFQ that you go out and select uh, an auditor uh, to go ahead and do this program for you. Several of the municipalities I represent do this. East Norton, your neighbor, uh, does it. Uh, Upper Marion, your neighbor, does it. Uh, Jenkintown, where I live, uh, does it. And White Marsh Township, which I also represent, does it. I believe Mr. Jones, uh, when I suggested this program to Mr. Jones nine or ten months ago, I believe he called Mr. Della Mater, uh, the manager of, of East Norton, and uh, Mr. Cranick, the manager of Upper Marion, and they both talked about a uh, substantial increase in revenues to the municipality once this program was implemented. Mm -hmm. Councilwoman Brady. Thank you, Madam President. With all the communica extra communication that it sounds like this program is going to entail, and maybe this is a question for Ms. Burkett, do we anticipate any budgetary impacts um, due to the adoption of this program? Uh, at this point, because it's in its uh, evidentiary stages, it, what we anticipate, what you would hope in the best case scenario is that uh, when we selected an auditor and they performed all of the tests that are required under that compliance rule, that there would be no findings that would result in any increased revenue because that means that everyone is compliant. However, realistically, findings would result in an additional increase in revenue, potentially. Uh, easy. I, 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 can, I can share with counsel, in, in terms of my conversations with, with the municipal administrators, in, in the other uh, municipalities. This program actually did result in uh, increased revenues uh, well above and beyond whatever administrative costs was associated with it. Um, I, I, in, I can, in East, in East Norton, which did it recently, uh, starting in 2014, I believe they saw an increase in revenue over $600,000. Yeah. And how f quickly does that increase in revenue offset the administrative costs of the program? That's really my question the, as to the, whether the administrative costs are a impediment to putting this program together. The administrative, and I, I don't want to speak for Crandall, but having been involved in this debate in East Norton, um, and the same questions were asked by some of the supervisors there, it's the cost of the auditor, it's the cost of uh, if my office has to go ahead and file legal papers. Uh, but I think in both Upper Marion and East Norton, when Crandall, uh, Mr. Jones did his due diligence, I know in the first year, like I said, there was a $600,000 net in East Norton over what the costs of implementation were of doing this program. Okay, and, and the auditors that we currently have would not be the auditors for this program? It, or would we be selecting it, additional a, it's ones? A, it's a different kind of audit. It's, it's a different kind of audit. Yeah. Oh, okay. It is a yeah. different right. kind of audit, how, yeah. and we would be putting out the RFQ yeah. um, for potential um, auditors to reply. And would we have to put out this RFQ every year while this program was being implemented to have auditors, or would the RFQ cover a particular period of time for this firm to be handling this program? Traditionally, it's a period of time that the engagement is covered for. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. At this time, would a member of council like to make a motion to adopt the proposed ordinance 16-01, the Local Taxpayers' Bill of Rights? 
Madam Secretary, may I have roll call, please? Marlon Milner? Aye. Libby Brady? Aye. Valerie Scott Cooper? Aye. Heather Lewis? Aye. Hakeem Jones? Aye. Derek Perry? Aye. Sonia Sanders? Aye. And the proposed ordinance of 16-01 of the local taxpayer bill, t taxpayer's bill of rights passes. The next order of business we have is finance. That will be led by Ms. Janora Burkett. Thank you, Madam President. You're welcome. Before you is a request to consider approval or disapproval of <coughs> advertising of the proposed ordinance to adopt the Norristown Paid Firefighter Pension Plan amendments. Uh, at the meeting scheduled in February of two uh, February 16th of 2016, we presented the preliminary uh, plan amendments that coincided with the collective bargaining agreement um, components that were related to pension plan um, changes and additional plan enhancements. The <coughs> collective bargaining agreement was ratified in July of uh, 2015 for the firefighters and the pension plan uh, amendments have been approved by the pension board. So what we're asking is uh, approval by council to advertise the ordinance um, for these changes to the plan to adopt that as an ordinance as part of the process. Would a member of council like to make a motion to approve the advertisement of a proposed ordinance to adopt Norristown paid firefighter pension plan amendments? Second. Discussion or question? All in favor? Aye. Any nays? Hearing none, the ayes have it. That motion is approved. Ms. Burkett, we have item B under finance. Would you please lead us into that discussion? Certainly, Madam President. Um, what we have presented to us is um, a request to consider an ordinance related to the proposed um, proposal provided by Vist Bank to refinance the interest rate on a bond obligation that the municipality currently has for a, uh, an obli general obligation note series of 2006. What uh, has been presented to Council at the previous meeting by our financial advisor, Concord Finance, were several scenarios. Um, and the recommended one was a, uh, refin a modification of the note that would uh, change the interest rate from 4.39, increasing in a variable pace, effective June of 2015, to 6.25% of a cap depending upon interest rates as we move through the remainder of the term of the bond obligation. The bond has a remaining period of 10 years. What VIST <clears throat> has proposed is an interest rate at a fixed rate for 2.85 percent for seven years and for the remainder of the term a uh, variable interest rate with a cap of 5.25 percent. And what we are presenting to Council is a request to consider advertising an ordinance <clears throat> an amendment to ordinance number 1104 that was originally passed in relation to an earlier proposal provided by this bank back in 2011 that was not acted upon at that time. Thank you, Ms. Parkhead. Madam President, if, if, uh, if you will, I'd like to make two points in terms of uh, this action. Uh, number one, it, that in doing so, Council actually reduces our interest uh, costs by over half a million dollars over the term uh, of, of the note. And the second part of it is this is uh, one of the steps as is the following items for actually uh, getting Norristown back into the financial markets as we look towards bringing Council uh, into discussions uh, about capital projects and financing the capital projects uh, going forward. So this is actually putting us back in, in the market so that we could start moving toward a process of actually getting a, a bond rating. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Would a member of council like to make a motion to approve the advertising of a proposed ordinance to amend ordinance that 11-04 to accept a proposed of VIST financial to reduce the interest rate portion of the municipality's general obligation note series of 2006. So moved. Second. Any discussion or question? Yes. Councilman Perry. Um, 
Ms. Burkett, um, you said in uh, 2011 uh, it was not acted upon. Um, what was the reason for that? In 2011, a proposal was offered by this bank uh, at a higher interest rate. However, um, when it was proposed at that time, the audits were not in place okay. for us to for the municipality to proceed with that offer. Uh, this offer is, in fact, at a better interest rate than what was offered at that time as well. Okay. And, and currently, where do we stand at um, in current right now in regards to we, that? In regards to? To um, our, our audits. We have completed through 2014. <laughs> we are scheduled to begin field work for our 2015 audit on April 4th. Okay, which would then give us our bond rating, you said? Uh, well, it's, it's, all a, it's all a step. There have been several things that council has done mm -hmm. over the co course of the last few uh, years or so to get us in, in a position. But this is one of those important steps uh, that we take in order you're actually getting in the financial market actively by doing this uh, adjustment of your financing. Mm -hmm of the bonds, so it, it definitely will look favorably as, as bond raters begin to look at us uh, going forward. Okay, um, and my last question is, uh, when was the last time that we had uh, been financially okay uh, over the years? When was the last time that we, does anybody have a year? Of we... I'm uh, not sure. Okay, yeah. so basically just currently. We have a fund balance that has been positive for several years. Okay. We have not been in the financing market to obtain financing for bond debt since 2006. All right, that's, that's what I wanted to hear. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you to the finance staff for your hard work and dedication for completing those audits to put Norristown in a better position. Thank Madam you. Secretary, may I have a roll call, please? Marlon Milner. <clears throat> Libby Brady. Valerie Scott Cooper, Aye. Heather Lewis, Aye. Hakeem Jones, Aye. Derek Perry, Aye. Sonia Sanders. Aye. That motion to approve the advertising of a proposed ordinance to amend ordinance 11-04 that accepts the proposal of this financial to reduce the interest rate portion of the municipality general obligation note series of 2006 is approved. Next order of business for finance is item C, Ms. Burkett. Thank you, Madam President. You're welcome. This is another component of the process and to move forward with uh, the entrance into the bond market, also the preparing of a capital improvement plan. Uh, one of the recommended steps for the municipality was to consider a resolution that declaring that the municipality would be would have the intent to reimburse the general fund for what could potent, would, would be capital asset expenditures as we move forward with the development of the plan. Thereby, if we have outlays that are components of the capital improvement plan, for instance, the road plans as we move forward with financing for that particular component, this would allow council to consider uh, requesting a reimbursement to the general fund for the capital improvement fund expenditure amounts that are funded. Would a member of council like to make a motion to approve resolution number dash, I'm sorry, number 16-112 to reimburse the general operating fund for capital improvement plan asset expenditures? So moved. Discussion. Councilman Milner. Unfortunately, I can't access my packet. Um, I'm just trying to understand the lot. I, procedurally, I understand what this motion is about. Um, but practically speaking, I'm trying to understand the logic when, to my knowledge, we've not approved a capital expenditure plan. I, I can, yeah, actually, you, you uh, have a, a road project that you have authorized us to bid on. And we're, we're about to put that road project out to bid. You have a roofing project that you've authorized us to bid on. We bid on it, and we'll be bringing those projects back to council. And going forward, as you're doing both capital and uh, whether it's capital facilities improvements or capital equipment purchases like vehicles, 
what this does, and there's a time period in which you have to do it to be able to reach back. What this does is put a mechanism in place that if council desires having its spender general fund dollars and actually then goes into the financial markets and does a borrowing, you can refund the general fund back to a certain period to recapture those funds. So we're putting this forward uh, so that in the event that the borrowing takes place, we can then, council can then authorize the general fund to be repaid from those uh, from those funds from a, a borrower. And that is as allowed with certain restrictions and also with uh, caveats based on the type of funding. And this is not a guarantee of a reimbursement to the general fund. This is an opportunity for you to consider that. A follow-up question. So what are those restrictions and caveats? The restrictions and caveats depend on the financing model that are whether or not that would be allowed to be reimbursable to the general operating fund. Can you elaborate or explain I, in plain language? I can provide some additional uh, information separately regarding the specific kinds of um, financing that are not eligible for this consideration. So a comment, um, it would seem to me that if we had, in fact, approved a capital improvement plan, we would know exactly what body of expenses would qualify restrictions, caveats, and timestamp notwithstanding. So again, procedurally, I understand what this does. Um, my discomfort is that it, it is the cart before the horse and that we should in fact have a capital improvement plan that we have approved knowing that we haven't gone out and done the bond financing that we were gonna to do to fund capital improvements and thereby would have a universe of said projects that we would know fall within the purview of the purpose of this resolution. Thank you. Councilwoman Brady. Thank you. Um, Regarding the capital improvement plan, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we had some kind of discussion about these capital improvement plan and approved something at budget time. Am I out in left field on that, or does my memory serve correctly? That was the five-year road project. Oh, okay. Yes, and that is part of That's what is part being of the considered. Whole, yeah. Yes, this is part of what is considered as part of this process, and that financing specifically is the Pennsylvania Infrastructure Bank financing that we are looking to obtain to fund that project. The timing of that funding is about six months in duration at its longest extent, and during that time, we may have outlays from the general fund liquid fuels to cover expenditures, and that is one example where that would be a component that could be considered by council should they so desire to reimburse the general fund. <laughs> so in response to Councilman Milner's question, uh, comment about the fact that we don't have a list of projects, we do have a list of projects. Madam President. Councilman Milner. Thank you. Councilwoman Brady, with all due respect, we already know what we did in the budget was to authorize doing a debt financing that would allow us to go out on the street and do a road program. We also know that there is an undetermined universe because we have not yet considered a capital improvement plan that we have in fact improved. We know there's a universe of needs that have been generally identified, but the fact is capital improvement what is being described here as capital improvement is not simply the five-year road program. And I fully understand what we just did. I stand by my comment, and I'm sure that the administrator is not just talking about the five-year road project. So I don't appreciate this one-upsmanship as if I don't know what the hell I'm talking about. Thank you. Councilman Jones, I mean, sorry, Mr. Jones, would you please care to elaborate? I, I just wanted to clarify in that this is appropriate because it, it, it will not make a difference at this point whether or not we have actually, council has adopted a plan. 
because this this uh, the, this 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 decision actually is just a putting a mechanism in place that once the plan is actually adopted, you have a tool in which to pay yourself back. This doesn't commit you to pay yourself back, doesn't commit you to pay the, pay the general fund back. It merely sets that tool up because there are going to be expenses that we have uh, that are related to capital needs that you, you're going to have to take care of, for instance, this roof, uh, the roads projects. Those expenses are, are, are going to happen. And so it's more prudent to put this in place so that once you've gotten your capital plan adopted, regardless of, of what you do then, you can make all of those decisions around what is the best uh, route for council to go in terms of financing that gives you that ability. But in these, uh, this, these projects that are going now, you put it in place so that they can be captured as well. If, if, uh, if council chooses uh, to actually do it. So it is, it is appropriate that this happen before the, the actual adopt, adoption of the plan. It will just be a tool you already have in your tool belt that can take care of things that happen before the, 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 the facilities and, and uh, equipment plan is, is adopted as well. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Madam Secretary, may I have roll call, please? Marlon Milner? Aye. Olivia Brady? Aye. Valerie Scott Cooper? Heather Lewis? Aye. Hakeem Jones? Aye. Derek Perry? Aye. Sonny Sanders? Aye. The motion to approve resolution number 16-112 to reimburse the general operating fund for capital improvement plan asset expenditures are approved. The next order of business we have is code. Councilman Perry, could you please uh, handle uh, code? Mr. Simonson, please uh, give us some information in regards to 732 Cone Street, please. Thank you, Councilman. Uh, 732 Cone Street, they uh, applied for their HARP certificate. The HARP certificate was approved by the board. It is to replace some existing, <coughs> excuse me, existing windows in the front of the building to, uh, to restore some, uh, some glass over the front door and to install two signs uh, one of various configurations on the side and on the front of the building. The signs were approved to the planning and zoning office prior to the, uh, the hearing at the HAR board. Olivia. Thank you. Um, just a comment. Um, in the past, we've had a lot more HAR certificates of appropriateness to approve. Why is it slowing down? Why do we only have one on the agenda for tonight? Winter time. We issue less permits during the winter. This is just a slower time for renovation season. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I'd like a motion to approve uh, the HARP certificate of appropriateness for 732 Cone Street. So moved. Second. Uh, All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any nays? The motion ayes pass. Would a member of council like to make a motion to adjourn the meeting? So moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Meeting adjourned. <laughs>